and yet the Germans are, but he's a German composer, and but the French are, but he's for liberty, and, <laughs> and the, the humanitarian ideals of the Enlightenment, and so, you know, all these things are true, and um, so in World War II it just got crazy in terms of the way the Ninth Symphony was appropriated, literally by every side had their take on why it was their, you know, their Beethoven. <laughs> so, and, um, and it, it was amazing to think that, um, you know, it was being played for Hitler's birthday in 39 at the same time um, that a group of um, uh, people in a concentration camp, um, the, these Jews in a concentration camp with, had with homemade instruments are trying to do um, the Ode to Joy, you know, and, and their little arrangement of it and for a concert before they get gassed and at the same time. So, um, and now it's used as the, the great uh, piece in China, or in Japan for, for New Year's. Um, yeah. It's like thousands of, hundreds of performances of, of the Ninth Symphony every New Year's in Japan. Mm -hmm. It's like Messiah over here. <laughs> so, but it's the Ninth Symphony. It's the Ode to Joy. All these like mass choirs, um, and they have classes in how to sing it, and so it's a big like sing along piece. Wow. I don't know whether you're aware of that. But I never heard that before. Oh yeah, it's that's, it's that's really Daiku. It's wow. their it's it's num the big nine. That's, that's what funny. <laughs> yeah. That's hilarious. So yeah, um, and you know, so it crosses all these cultures. At the same time, it doesn't hit every single... I mean, Beethoven, I don't think, speaks to Australian aboriginals necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> but, or, you know, the headhunters in Borneo. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly, you know, for a certain chunk of the world, it's, it's considered universal. But, you know, the rhythmic... What we were saying before about this whole thing about the rhythmic gestalt, mm -hmm. um, there's a component to meter and rhythmic, rhythm and timing and all that that... Um, does speak to people, and so if if that music was taken and put into drum signal, right? Yeah, exactly. I think the, you would find Aborigines being able to to relate more. Yes, but the problem is you've got all this other stuff encrusted on it—the harmony and the counterpoint. And, yeah, um, if you take that out, <laughs> I mean, you could probably do polyrhythmic. In, right. uh, uh, representations of some of that, I, I, I would imagine. Yeah. And to me, you know, yeah. the, in terms of world music, Western music is out of step. We're, we're the only ones that have preoccupied ourselves with harmony and counterpoint. Uh -huh. And everybody else is, you know, really big on rhythm and, and, um, and complex melody. So, um, or sometimes simple melody, but, but rhythm is like a huge element in, in world music. So that, that yeah. It just gets kind of lost over here. That, I think that that's kind of what Beethoven was really connecting with. Because um, there's just some really profound rhythmic stuff going on. Oh and, yeah, well, well, are you aware that the black community claims him as a, as a black composer? Um, yes, and, I, and that has to do with a, because of the, how he was described by contemporaries. Well, and um, apparently he had a maternal grandmother that, right. that was African. This so, is what I understand. So there's, yeah. you know, a bit of black blood and that there. his mother was therefore biracial. Yeah. Um, and so, and, the, and he was described by some people with right, what the I thick lips and the, the flatter And they call him a blackamoor and, you know, some terminology. Right. Well, because he was more swarthy, complected. Yeah. And so, um, to me, I always liked that when I first came across that. Um, uh, those associations and those writings. I, I well, I think it's great because, and also too. in terms of the, the rhythmic mm -hmm. thing, that um, it just inherently he would have more of a relationship with syncopation than his German compadres. And truly, his, his music is way more syncopated and, and at the same time quite rhythmically driven um, than a Haydn or Mozart, anything like that. You know, uh, any of those guys running at the same time. His is like supercharged with syncopations. So, which, um, you know, I've always kind of felt that there's like... A, a, it's something I call Beethoven jazz. So, you know, and, and really to get that locked in at, at various points just makes the music come alive. I, I think so, too. I, 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 I mean, just two things come to mind with full fifth, obviously. The well, and it that's, unifies that's, the whole work. I mean, it's in every movement in, in various ways. Yeah. And 
it's it's amazingly rhythmically um, cohesive. And the seventh is a piece of rhythmic. I mean, you know, I mean, the melody is a rhythm, really. I mean, sure. Kind of, and, yeah. Well, and Wagner called it the apotheosis yeah. of the dance. Um, pum, 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 pum. Um, yeah. Just sort of heartbeat kind of Johnny uh, one note, right? Yeah. yeah. So and that uh, that movement was encored twice in the first performance, the the allegretto of the seventh symphony. Mm -hmm. So um, the audience loved it so much. <laughs> but it's often done quite slow compared to to Beethoven's actual mark, and that's that's then brings us into this whole idea of tempo, which you had brought up in your emails. Um, and I mean, Beethoven's quite specific about. The tempos, and I think you know, I explained his process and coming up with those. But um, at the same time, you know, for any given circumstance, it would be different, I would think. So, given the group that you have to work with, or your mood at the time, or the mood of the group, or the the zeitgeist, um, just generally, I mean, right. you know, if it's a happy time, you might take it quicker than if it's a sad time. Mm -hmm. Just, um, and I think. Also, the acoustics of halls have something to do with that. So, to be slavish to a metronome is is not necessarily ideal either. But it's it'll inform us. I mean, of what Beethoven really is is on about. So, you know, what's what is the the marking at the beginning of this movement? Do you recall the the second movement? Uh, the 90. Italian no, the Italian oh. words. What the second movement? Uh, Dante. But. Yeah, it's con moto. Con moto, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, what's what does that mean? Do you know? Um, and Dante with me. some with motion, uh, with the. Mm -hmm. Right. So, what's on Dante then? Um, that's sort of like a medium. On this, on the slow side of medium, kind of. Well, then, what would moderato be? Say it again? Moderato. Moderate. Right. So uh, wouldn't that be what you're describing? Right. So what's on Dante? Moderately slow. Uh, okay, but slower than moderato. That's yeah. what I'm trying to establish. Is that, okay. Yeah, so, but I think it's just on, the, on that side, mm -hmm. but pretty close to moderato. Mm -hmm. And then when you add Kormoto in there, it, you know, starts to then become confusing. Because it's not slow anymore. He's asking you to do it, you know, keep moving it along. Mm -hmm. So, um, but like, you know, we were talking in class on Friday, the, um, each one of the sections can have discreetly different tempo. That all, they all kind of relate. Um, I, I studied for three years with a, an old German guy just at the end of his life. He was, he, he, I think I killed him at age 90. But I, I had like the, his last three years, because I was doing two lessons a week, and then finally sent him into the hospital doing Appalachian Spring. <laughs> um, but um, he uh, had this thing about romantic music that there would be an overriding tempo, you know, that was the, the metronome mark, whatever, or the, the Italian words. Um, but then within that, there, for each section, every, every section had its own character, meaning it would have its own tempo. So that there would be these m multiple levels of tempo going on within any given movement in a romantic style. And this man saw Mahler conduct. He, he was a Wagnerian conductor when he was 13. He was a Wunderkind and working in the, the German opera houses at the turn of the century. And so, I mean, it was really... And I, was this the guy that, 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 that poked you or did... No, no, that was something. totally different. Okay. You know, I, I never studied with him. He was just... The, uh, those were legends. In fact, I avoided him at, at USC. I was supposed to take his class, but I was like, no, I'm going to step out something else. So, um, but, uh, no, his, this guy's name is Fritz Spieg, and he was really big in Germany back in the early part of the century, but then had a herniated larynx, and they burned it out with um, a, a therapy that wasn't, it was pretty bad, so, anyway, he couldn't talk. He had he spoke like this <laughs> when I was working with him. So he couldn't really rehearse a, a group very effectively. Um, but he, he worked with all these amazing people um, 
as students. I mean, Marilyn Horn was one of his students. So, um, and a variety of conductors. But, um, so that always struck me as, you know, really important information that the tempos shouldn't be the same, you know. Though if you have, like in the Beethoven, this one tempo that keeps coming back and gets varied, that should have some kind of relationship to its various incarnations. So to me, that's the 92. That's the okay. one that, you know, you would want to move along. Okay. But the, um, the ta -da -da -di -da -di -da -di -da. I think you can linger a little. Da -di -da 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 -da. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Right. And so, and then and then the ta da dim di da dum would could pick up again. So yeah. it's basically what I was doing with the the orchestra here, and then um, so 